So there you were, happily working on your game, when suddenly you are greeted by an error message telling you to use call deferred instead. You thought to yourself, hmm, that's weird, and you changed the call to a deferred call. The error seemed to be gone. You could now continue working happily on your game. Except, why? Why does it work that way and why, all of a sudden, do you have to use a seemingly arbitrary new way of calling a function? Well, in this video you're gonna learn how it works, why, and how we use call deferred. So let's just get this straight first. In a nutshell, call deferred calls a function a bit later. Now, why would we ever want to use this? Well, there are actually many cases. For one, physics related stuff need to be stable or otherwise your game can start behaving incredibly weird. That's why changing collision shapes, adding new collisions and removing collisions is generally better done outside of the physics process. Another thing is that some functions might need resources to be fully ready before they can be used. For example, procedurally generated geometry and light could be missing from voxel global illumination if not using call deferred when baking it. Interacting with the active tree in C is not thread safe and adding or removing nodes from the scene can cause issues and also swapping between scenes can be especially problematic as freeing a scene directly could even lead to crashes because that scene might still be executing code. Another case could just be for synchronization purposes. For example, the navigation server generally needs to wait for the first physics frame to be synchronized and call deferred can help with just that. And even for simply getting more reliable outcomes, for interacting with control nodes, for example, when trying to grab the focus of a control node, you might need to use call deferred. And of course, finally, you'll most probably know when to use it in all other cases, because Godot is going to be complaining about it. Now, how does call deferred actually work? Well, that's an easy question to answer, right? Let's just check the documentation. It looks like it just calls the specified method during idle time. What is idle time, you ask? Idle time is a lie. Or so says one Reddit user under the name the Daryl, which has been dutifully correcting this for years. So which one is it? Are the dogs correct or has the truth been hidden in the sayings of this Redditor? Let's take a look at the source code of call deferred to find this once and for all. To begin with, let's look at the callable's call deferred function. It looks like call deferred takes the method arguments and, if any, passes them down as variant pointers together with the actual number of arguments to call deferred p, which in turn pushes the callable and its arguments in the message queue singleton as a message. Now I know this might sound complicated, but basically call deferred adds the procedure to be called inside the queue. Now how are the methods processed? Well, the message queue has a method called flush, which basically just calls every method in that queue. What's really cool about this method is that it is designed in such a way that if one of the functions in the queue also defers a call, that call is just going to be added to the queue that is already being processed. So now, the only thing that remains is to find out when is this actually called. Where is that idle time? If we take a look at the main loop, we'll see some low-level basic game loop structure. For example, inside the loop iteration, physics servers get synchronized which is basically just a way of saying, hey, I'm doing stuff right now, so let me finish. And the main physics process is executed. There's also some navigation being processed, but finally, there is one flush happening. Moving on, the physics server synchronization finishes and there's another flush happening. Finally, it's time for the process to be executed and there's another flush. The main loop is not even the only place where this occurs. The same story happens in the scene tree, which extends the main loop and focuses on managing everything within a scene from nodes to signals and physics. There's a call to the message queue right after the physics process and two more calls after the process. While a bit hacky, they're there. Now finally, you'll also find flash calls after loading resources with a resource loader and in the main cleanup function, which frees all memory. There, the message queue is flushed before having the scene uninitialized, and then, finally, right before deleting the message queue, it is being flushed one last time. Ah, oh, what a journey. So, it seems that call deferred acts in many different circumstances, but it looks like the deferred methods will be typically called when it's safe to modify game states, such as after physics and process calls. Okay, now that we have an idea of what happens, let's see how we can actually use this. Okay, now let's say we have this scene in which we simply want to rotate this cube. I could go to this cube and add a new script. 
and inside the script for example i could just say rotate and let's just say vector 3 and let's choose a direction on which we rotate so 1.0 1.0 and 0, 0.0 this direction has to be normalized and finally we want to rotate by some amount every time let's just make a variable let's call it var rotation amount and let's just make it be like 0 0.1 why not so i'm just gonna take this rotation amount and if i were to save and press f5 right now well it may may be a bit fast <laughs> maybe let's go with 0, 0, 001 but yeah our cube rotates pretty nicely okay now if we wanted to call this function in a deferred way what we would have to do would be to simply say call deferred and now we get the string name of that function so i'm just gonna say rotate and additionally i am going to simply add the parameters so the first parameter is going to be vector 3 normalized and the second parameter is going to be rotation amount okay now that i have those i can comment the initial rotation and with call deferred you see that basically the same thing happens now there are other ways of doing this so for example maybe i have a reference to a callable so let's just say that var my callable is equal to rotate dot bind and let's just bind our arguments so i'm just gonna bind vector 3 something normalized and the rotation amount now i have this callable inside a variable so i can just say my callable dot call deferred and by doing this i'm basically doing the exact same thing that i am doing here in line 14. so if i comment out and run again you see that my cube is still rotating now one other thing that i might want to do would be to maybe call multiple functions in a deferred way and i could simply do that by using a lambda function so if for example i define my lambda function something like func and let's just say that it simply rotates on one axis and on another axis i could just take this rotate code and instead of rotating on uh, x and y let's just rotate on x and i don't even have to normalize it because it's already normalized and let's also rotate on y so now i basically called two functions in this lambda function and what i can do to this is to simply call deferred so basically this is kind of the same thing as what i have here with my callable but instead of using a callable from godot i am creating my own through this lambda function now if i comment this one i can save and i can press f5 and you see the rotation happens in the same way now what's really cool about deferring lambda functions is that they also allow us to defer signal emissions so for example if i had this signal called peanut what I could do would be to just come in this uh, lambda function, let's maybe comment out everything and simply say peanut.emit. So now I have emitted a signal a bit later. And yeah, if I wanted to, let's say, uh, connect this signal, so let's just connect it to the same thing. On peanut, maybe let's just print a peanut. So peanut. Okay, if I press F5 you'll see that I have now a bunch of peanuts <laughs> that are called in a deferred way. Now, what's amazing is that if we are on Godot 4.3, we can emit a signal directly without even using a Lambda function. So for example, I could just say peanut.emit and .call deferred. And if I do that and comment out everything else, you'll see that again, I'm going to print a bunch of peanuts. Now finally, if what you wanted was maybe just to wait for one frame, then you could consider instead of using call deferred to use the physics frame and the process frame signals. The signals are emitted immediately before the following process and the following physics process. So let's see how this works in practice. If I were to go back to my code, I could simply comment this and let us just connect these signals to our own peanut function. So I'm just gonna say get three and let's just say process frame because we are inside the process and let's just connect this to on peanut okay 
And just to see that this works, let's also print out the current frame that we are on. So I'm just going to say print frame number. And let's just say frame number. Yeah, let's just make a variable. So I'm just going to say here var frame number. And let's make this equal to zero for now. So I'm just going to print frame number. And let's not also forget to add one to this frame number. So plus equals to one. Now, if I save, if I press F5, you'll see that going up, the frame number is printed before the actual peanut is printed. So basically, this happened exactly after the frame. Now, you might see that our debugger is getting kind of insane right now. And what this says is that we are connecting this uh, signal again and again. And if we don't want to see these errors, what we can do is to simply just add here another flag called connect one shot. And what this does is basically connect the signal. And after the signal is emitted, it disconnects it. And of course, when we restart the process, it connects again and so on. But if we save right now, and if I press F5, you'll see that I no longer get those warnings. I only get smarter and smarter every day because of today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is designed to make you a better thinker by offering engaging interactive lessons that sharpen your problem solving skills. It doesn't just teach a theory, it helps you think like a problem solver with hands-on exercises, which will help you develop your abilities of recognizing and solving complex problems that game developers frequently encounter. Most importantly, every lesson is rewarding and to the point. For this reason, Brilliant will seamlessly fit in your daily routine and you'll only need to invest just a few minutes each day in order to develop habits that will take your skills to the next level. In order to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash cashewalldue or scan this QR code for 20% off their premium annual subscription.